Hi, my name is Anthony Castronovo, and uh, I'm an artist and an educator here in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I work mostly as a sculptor, and my work is mostly about ecology, um, looking at the relationship between humans and nature, and looking at art and the potential of art to connect people and as an activist tool. I teach classes at Santa Fe College and at the University of Florida, both in the sculpture area and in digital media. Uh, and last year I had the chance to teach a new course called Picturing Ecology, which was uh, a course where we looked at artists that make work about the environment, and we developed a collaborative project as a group. And uh, pretty immediately the Copper Superfund site issue came up as something that we wanted to work on, and we developed uh, an exhibition called Picturing Ecology, where all of the students made work about the Copper Superfund site, and we had a public opening. And uh, that exhibit was very successful. It was a really good turnout and it created a lot of conversations that are continuing to this day. Um, so that's where I got started with the Superfund project. Um, shortly thereafter, Kim Popejoy asked me if I would be interested in co-chairing, helping him form a committee that would be based on the idea of using art to explore the science and um, get the community involved in this Copper Superfund issue. The Superfund site in Gainesville is the Copper's Cabot Superfund site and the reason it's called the Cabot Coppers is there were two companies that um, had industrial processes on, on these properties actually going back into I think 1916 or something. So there were these industrial activities going on for that long and um, Actually, neither of the companies are, are still actively using the properties for any kind of manufacturing. They've, they've closed down their operations, but, but the Superfund site is really the, the legacy left over from um, the way they managed or mismanaged their waste materials and their hazardous materials storage and things like that. So really, it's the legacy of, of almost 100 years of chemical handling and mishandling. The Superfund Art Project wants to use the visual and the performing arts in order to deal with this issue in a positive way. When I was working with the city of Gainesville, one of the rewarding things that I found was how you could bring citizens and government together to solve problems. And as the gallery director for the Thomas Center, it was always a challenge because you have a wide variety of different constituencies, people with all sorts of different ideas about what art should be, uh, how it should be displayed, and you also had the city government and you had rules and regulations that had to be followed. So trying to work with all of these different factors was uh, a challenge but also a very rewarding experience. And it convinced me that citizens can work with the government and they can work with governmental agencies such as the EPA and they can work with corporate partners and even corporations that are not so positively disposed in order to combine forces and have a positive outcome. And that's the whole point behind the Superfund Art Project. We want to see a positive outcome. We want to take a liability and turn it into an asset. One of the concerns is every time it rained when they were operating, some of the waste materials that were in some of these holding lagoons or in some of the chemical process areas the rain would wash these chemicals into a drainage ditch and that would make its way to Springstead Creek and then Springstead Creek flows into Hogtown Creek. So um, there was probably over a, lo a long time of the operation of these chemical plants, there was, every time it rained, you probably had a pulse of chemicals that were really being flushed into the creeks. What attracted me to the Superfund art project was simply the fact that I grew up on the creek below the Superfund site and um, saw the creek go from beautiful, clean, pristine, swimmable water to uh, covered with creosote after one dumping. Um, and then that creosote had destroyed everything in the creek and uh, left a terrible smell. And we lived with that at our house all through my formative years until I was in my 20s there was still visible banks of creosote and so I grew up with the, the creek and the pollution from the copper site all my life it was just a, a 
a major impact on my life. But back at the time when these uh, lagoons were breached by the developer, all of this material just seeped into the creek and we had a, a big problem with just very nasty, tarry-like material that had flowed into the creek, killed a lot of the, the fish and wildlife, and uh, you know, you can go back and look at old Gainesville Sun articles from that time period, and even back then, um, people were coming to the Gainesville City Commission complaining about the nuisance, and there were articles in the Gainesville Sun way back into the 1960s complaining about what had happened. I am a psychologist and I spend most of my life uh, working with trauma patients uh, who have been in war zones and living next to a Superfund site is a lot like that in many ways. Uh, you're dealing with people who are in a helpless, powerless position, um, have a level of stress that's ongoing and they have to rely on authority figures to rescue them or not. Um, and what is interesting about that to me, aside from the professional interest, is the experience of the neighbors, the survivors of this experience, versus the technicians and the politicians who are involved in the cleanup. And the very different worlds of the two of those, those groups, they speak a different language and they express themselves very differently. So the piece that I've worked up kind of highlights that, that difference um, in experience and in speaking language, the nomenclature that each of these groups use. First of all, a lot of this waste material they were putting in the ground, at the time they put it there, unfortunately it wasn't against the law. And part of that was probably just ignorance. We didn't have the pollution control laws and the environmental awareness that we have today. And so for, for years they had these soakage pits and really the idea is that you'd pour these waste materials in these pits and all they really knew is that some of the stuff disappeared. No one really thought about where did it go, but these soakage pits or these percolation ponds, that was another thing they called them, they were really intended to get rid of this liquid chemical waste material, have it seep deep into the ground and no one, it was sort of like out of sight, out of mind, no one really thought about it. I got involved in the Superfund art project because of a friend of mine by the name of Margaret Talbert and she is a local artist who has a keen interest in, in the springs of Florida. And um, the copper side has polluted the main stem of Hogtown Creek. And um, I used to hike up that thing with my kids looking for shark's teeth and stuff like that. And on a hot summer day, it'd be sure nice to, you know, find a little deep pool and, and take a swim. But we could never do that up on Hogtown Creek, mainly because of coppers. I realize coppers isn't the only problem that these creeks face. There are, there are other pollution sources and just other problems that, that urban creeks in general face. And, um, but coppers, of course, is a very significant one. The, the pollution with, with um, all those chemicals in the main stem of, of uh, Hawktown Creek. So I am an artist. I feel my emotions and I create my world with my art. Uh, one of the latest pieces I did was about a community lymphatic system. It's about how we as a community are intricately connected. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the work turned into an aquifer. I feel like as a community, we're flowing and affecting everything we do. And that's why this uh, toxic site seeping into the aquifer struck me severely. Like, what are we doing? We're poisoning this beautiful system underneath that's connecting us to all of Florida, to the oceans. So I feel like as an artist, we have the power to educate, illuminate, but imagine. We can imagine brand new things that the EPA or the government or the big money makers, they're not even paying attention to. And artists in general use their emotions to change form into other forms, and that's what I'm talking about. We can transform with our imagination in ways that we can't even imagine yet, because we got to just keep dreaming. The Citizen Biodetector is a wearable sensor vest that allows a user to walk freely and sample water quality using a pH sensor. This data is stored to a flashcard with GPS and timestamp, and can later be mapped using Google Maps or other GPS plotting um, applications and allows you to visualize water quality in relationship to 
a map or um, space. My inspiration for this piece was, you know, thinking about coppers and the copper Superfund site. I realized that a lot of the pollution was runoff that was happening during rainfalls and um, getting into Springstead Creek and Hogtown. So I wondered if if citizens had something, a sensor or some device that was easily um, easily used and they could walk around and test water quality, would that help the situation? Would that help um, bring an awareness? Um, so my idea was to make this sensor. Region 4 is the southeastern United States, and that's the designation that the Environmental Protection Agency gives to this part of the country. And yet Region 4 sounds to me almost like something out of science fiction, like Area 9 or something, where it has a kind of impersonality, a kind of an alien quality to it. And so one of the things we really are trying to do with this exhibit is to personalize that, to make it not just something that's in Region 4, but a specific site, uh, because there are many of these sites scattered, 1,100 of them around the United States. Each one has a particular story. Each one has citizens that are impacted by it. And so this is our own Region 4 site. And the Cabot Copper site is something that's very personal to us. When, when I got the call for entries, I realized that, or maybe not even right then, maybe later, I realized that I can't, I'm not the kind of person to go to meetings about coppers, and I'm not going to go pound my fists on tables, and I'm not going to organize, but I can make a painting. And it was, it was nice to realize that. So that's what got me interested in it. Uh, so Murphy's Wellbeing is uh, uh, an installation that functions as a consultancy. Uh, the Florida Research Ensemble, composed of myself and Greg Ulmer and Barbara Jo Ravel, uh, Lou Keo and Sam Lopez, have constructed this piece uh, with the intent of doing just exactly that, literally. We are an art consultancy. Uh, we are trying to propose that uh, a way to deal with this issue, with these kinds of disasters, is to uh, reconstruct our priorities culturally and that, um, uh, that we have to uh, prioritize well-being, individual and collective well-being. Um, and so uh, the goal is, is that we'll illuminate the uh, sets of conditions that caused the, cap the Copper Superfund site to exist. Um, and um, so we draw a parallel between uh, the threat to our well field and the threat to our well-being. That, uh, that those things are not separated, that they are, are very much one and the same. Um, and that, that once we become aware of that, hopefully we'll change directions in the way that we act and behave. Probably by the late 70s, the University of Florida, at least the, the academic side, knew there was a problem. Um, it wasn't until the early 1980s that the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, um, or, or the agency that they were at that time, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency formally recognized this site as a Superfund site. And I think it was 1983 when they listed it formally as, as a site. And they put it on what's called the National Priority List. Basically, that's a list of the most toxic waste sites in the United States. It really pissed me off that I was working at the University of Florida a mile away from one of the Superfund sites and that it was less than two miles away from the Murphy Welk Fields where Gainesville gets all of its water. I mean, literally, I mean, I was shocked at, that this was a, an issue that was, it, it was there and it was part of the uh, community's literal life blood. And, and then I found out almost no one in Gainesville knew anything about it. That perplexed me. So I was initially pissed off and then I was perplexed that nobody seemed to be aware of this. I had a teacher, Joanna Macy, who 20 years ago, she called herself an eco-feminist. She was addressing toxic waste sites with radioactive waste. And she said, this stuff's not going anywhere. What are we going to do about it? She introduced to me the concept that when we, as humans, create such a gigantic mess of toxicity, we have to step up and be responsible. We can't just 
slip anything under the rug. In fact, she, she talked about making it a sacred site. That not only do we remember what's going on, but we bring reverence to that. That we teach our children, wow, we made a mistake. We're going to talk about it. We're going to teach you the big mistake we made so you don't have to make that anymore. And that to me struck such a bell that the toxic sites on this planet now become temples and they become altars that we don't have to continue damaging our planet, that we use the mistakes to teach the children, inspire the children, and be accountable. There's power in being accountable. The Superfund site affects everyone. It comes, it's, it's a very dangerous issue to me. The aquifer is being affected. The concern we have with the Florida aquifer is that that is our area's primary source of drinking water, really the sole source of drinking water. We don't have um, surface waters in, in, our, in our area that would be sufficient to supply um, the, the community's drinking water. So we are dependent on the Florida aquifer. I think that, you know, we're going to have to be patient and they're going to continue to try to remediate the actual site. And I think, in a way, it could be sort of a wake-up call. I think the project might help other communities in this community because everyone's affected differently. As an educator, I understand that everyone learns in a different way, and we have visual learners. So it's going to take seeing things to affect some people. It'll help them understand, the visual thinkers. The process is, I've always come from a psychological place when I make images. And <clears throat> this was an image, um, the title is Aquaphobia Masking the Issue. And it's a drawing that came from a photograph of a friend, a good friend of mine who was a mime at the time, washing off her white face in this case in very questionable water. And um, I just, I, I feel like people are gonna have to really look for what's going on in the picture. They'll find clues and find another clue and another clue. They're very tiny and they're ambiguous, kind of like the issue. I spent a lot of my life as a psychologist trying to create wholeness out of situations that are very fracturing. This whole coppers thing is, a f is part of life that's very fracturing. It's very traumatic. It, it can, in effect, crush people. What I'm interested in doing is creating an experience where, where at very least, that struggle gets voice. Out of that struggle, hopefully, dialogue will happen about the struggle on both sides, on all sides of all this and a wholeness can get created. The concern is, is that a couple of miles north of the Copper's Cabot site um, is the Murphy well field. And what that is, that's the city of Gainesville, Gainesville Regional Utilities um, water supply well field. And, and that's an area where they've got a number of wells that are um, installed all the way down to the Florida aquifer. And they're pumping the Florida aquifer and that is that is our drinking water source. Uh, we have to get past this kind of us and them mentality where people look at one set of people and say, okay, they're in this situation and that's really you know, too bad for them, but it doesn't affect me. We have to realize that these problems affect all of us, especially when it comes to the, uh, the well field and our water in North Central Florida, that, um, that the, the situation isn't isolated to just the neighborhood where that structure exists. That, eventually it will contaminate everyone's water and uh, that's something that the cost is much greater than the local cleanup um, entails at this point. If this contamination got into the wells, the cost of water in Gainesville would just, it could, it could just totally uh, damage the economy because all of a sudden water that's relatively cheap now and people f have a pretty high confidence level in it all of a sudden it would be really expensive to treat that water. I spent a lot of my time attending meetings and uh, just talking to people on the street to get the material for the, the piece. Um, and 
been fascinated by the difference of experience between these two groups and the fact that you get this range of emotion. All good art is about touching on someone's emotion. It's about expressing an emotion. Um, and there's been a lot of it um, on both sides. Um, the, the range of, of emotions goes from anger to denial um, in, the, in terms of the residents. Um, the, the experience of the people who are treating this situation are responsible for cleaning it up. Um, there's an optimism that, that's being expressed. There's a, um, uh, a feeling that they want to instill confidence. Um, they're in effect marketing and selling their, their help to the community. Um, so that they're very positive and very um, upbeat um, in a very tragic situation. You know, back in 1800s and early 1900s, artists did all these beautiful, pretty pictures of the wild landscapes, Herzog and um, oh, the luminists, and people did these um, sort of like travelogue paintings showing what wonders of nature there were, and, um, and this is not that. And the reason it's not is that that's gone. Um, there aren't, there's no more wilderness. I mean, maybe some national parks, but certainly not around here. And um, so this is not like one of those pretty pictures of the, you know, of the natural world. Um, I think that, that if I taped um, crime scene tape across here, that um, the idea would come across better. The companies responsible for this contamination, we don't know where they are going to be in 20 or 30 years. I mean, are they going to declare bankruptcy? Are they going to somehow do some kind of a takeover and a subsidiary thing where all of a sudden the assets are moved around? And so we don't want the community to be stuck with a hundred million dollar cleanup or, you know, that's, that's just something that we don't want to have to deal with. So. That's why it's so important to move forward now, I mean, not only to really figure out how far the contamination has spread, but also to deal with it, because um, we want to, we really do want to hold the responsible parties accountable now. We don't want this coming back to bite us 20 or 30 years from now. To be honest, what attracted me was uh, the idea of getting artists involved with a um, site that had had so many problems. and. Many times artists like to go into areas that are perhaps abandoned or uh, misused and try to reclaim um, that space. And that's the way I fe felt about the Copper's uh, Cabot site. I felt that bringing in new positive energy would uh, be a good thing. Uh, for the area and uh, I wanted to personally make a statement about it myself. I decided I had to make a kind of a big change from moving from the, the landscapes which were kind of neutral politically uh, and, and, um, and, and kind of deal with these in a way that I suppose would be kind of uh, aligned with the notion of um, editorial cartoons that you might see in the paper. Uh, the EPA uh, gallops to the rescue, that's uh, kind of a um, uh, tongue-in-cheek title. And so I allowed myself uh, to deal with sarcasm um, and uh, in, in drawing, it is, and and, uh, and and other kinds of fairly pointed uh, states of mind in order to to, de to deal with this. Another component of this is that following the exhibition at the Thomas Center, we want to put this exhibit on tour, because there are 43 sites in Florida, a number of, of super fun sites, and there are uh, places in the areas that are impacted by Superfund sites where this exhibition might mean a great deal to the citizens in that area. They might be able to see an exhibit like this to be inspired to do something similar in their community, 
to try to bring artists and scientists together and, and corporate entities as well and government agencies to face these problems together and work on them and find some kind of common solution. My painting um, is basically a map, a, a child's map of the creek and the surrounding area of, from the copper site. And it includes um, all the trees that we climbed that we had named. Um, it includes tree forts and springs where we would catch fish and the banks where we would get clay to make pots and the special places that we went, including neighbors' houses and my aunt's house that was just down the creek from me. And it includes the site itself, which we just called the pole yard. And it includes um, the big black pond, which was actually uh, the big ponds of Creosote where they dipped the telephone poles. And it includes the big hill where we always rode our bikes. We would uh, sneak under the fence and go in and ride our bikes on a large dirt hill, which was actually where they dug out to make the big black pond. And um, it includes the tunnel under 6th Street where we, we would get in the creek on our, in our John boats and especially after a rain, go down the creek. And uh, it's basically just a map in oil of the, of the neighborhood. You know, I think a nice ultimate goal for, for Gainesville in, in relation to the copper site is to get that thing cleaned up and to maybe make a park out of it. It was a Superfund site. I think the Superfund Art Project uh, raises the uh, awareness of people in the area by uh, publishing information essentially on the history, the proposed remediation and the future use and reclamation of the site. Now, I think that's really what the most important part of this is. There are other kind of side aspects to this where it's a really interesting idea for the Superfund Art Project to be a situation involving artists and scientists and other people in the community coming together and looking at this whole thing from a multi uh, faceted perspective, which I don't think has probably ever been done before. Uh, I certainly don't think it's been done in Gainesville. In fact, I was telling uh, Rebecca Nagy, who's director of the Harlem Museum of Art, that this may be one of the most cutting edge and exciting art projects that's ever been shown in Gainesville because of the fact that the artists and the scientists and other interested people collaborated on such a complex project. Beginning with our ignorance of the consequence of our actions and continuing through our poorly coordinated efforts at remedy, human error must be overcome by concentrated human caring. That's the message we want to get out. Oh, my God.